I'd like to welcome Vivian Block, who's going to talk to us about uh, developing broad spectrum resistance to the potato cyst nematodes. Can I, can I turn this slightly? Is that allowed? Right, good morning. Um, yes, I was asked to talk about combining resistance, and I have to say this is a slightly more ambitious uh, title than um, I'm really able to live up to. So I'm going to primarily focus on what I know about rather than everything that there is to be known. All right, so long time ago, 1952, they found resistance to Globodera rostockiensis in the, the CPC, stands for the Commonwealth Potato Collection. We hold that at the James Hutton Institute. And it was pretty rapidly integrated into tuberosum, the potatoes that are used for, uh, for consumption. Um, great story. This particular variety, Maris Piper, is one that's very popular in the UK. It's a big part of our market. Now, this is a slide I prepared probably over 10 years ago, but it probably doesn't change so much. And it was to show the proportion of what is actually grown in the UK um, that has resistance. So you can see Maris Piper is a very popular variety. And of all the commercial varieties that are grown, quite a large percent have resistance. They have H1 incorporated into it, but not everything. You know, more than half was still susceptible to Globodera rostockiensis. And at that point, 10-ish years ago, maybe longer when I prepared this, a very small part of what was grown had any resistance to Globodera pallida. That was partial resistance. It wasn't grown because it was having any resistance. It just happened to be a variety that, for some reason, um, had some commercial use. So basically, UK was growing 100% susceptible varieties to Globodera pallida. A, a colleague of mine who's now retired made this little demonstration of what would happen if you started using H1. Um, so the graph on the right is trying to show both the impact of resistant variety in terms of the low multiplication or practically zero multiplication you have, plus a decline factor, and then what happens over crop cycles. So in UK, our crop cycles tend to be probably longer than here, maybe four or five, six years. So you would gradually see Globodera rostockiensis disappear. And that would give Pallida a, an opportunity to compete. So Rostock tends to hatch faster. The idea is it would be able to have an advantage if the two species are present together. So if you begin to remove Rostock from the field and there is some Pallida there, it's got a much better chance of building up and multiplying. So this is a survey from 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Um, 64% of the land in England and Wales had PCN present. You can see that Pallida had 43%. There was 16% mixed populations and a small amount just with Rostock. So even then, you know, Maris Piper was introduced into cultivars in the 60s. So already, you know, there's a very big impact of, of using that resistance on what's in the field. Um, this is a recent study, it's still preliminary, done by a, a PhD student that works with Matt Back down at Harper Adams University. She found 48% of the samples that she had had PCN in them. Again, 43% were Pallida, 2% Rostock, so a little bit less even than 15 years ago, and very few mix. So of the total number of samples that were PCN positive now, the vast majority are Pallida. So really demonstrating the impact that resistance can have on, on, a, um, on Globodera. So John will probably give you more up-to-date data on this. So Scotland, the PCN situation isn't quite as advanced as it was in, in England, so a lot more clean land. However, in the region that has the, a very high intensity of both wear and seed production, the amount of PCN is quite high, which is very concerning because of our seed production area. And I'm sure John will talk a bit more about that. Right, so going back, before people like me who are molecular biologists um, came upon the scene, you know, they had to figure out a way to try to help the breeders to get on with 
producing resistance. And although there's been criticism of this scheme, it still, to me, was a, a really important part of trying to get things going, um, you know, to collect different populations and also to take the resistance that was available in the germplasm to try to come up with a scheme of what to focus on. Um, and it still is something referred to today. There's also the South American pathotype scheme, which um, has been a very, very important part for historically um, informing the breeding programs. So I just wanted to re refer to that. Um, I'm not a potato breeder. I'm not a potato geneticist. And I'll try to show you that it's, it's, it's a bit of a mess, really, I think, although maybe the breeders know what they're doing. This is also, to me, a really key part of the story. Um, this is from the group in France, from INRA, from Eric Grenier and Didier Meunier. They had a student who was allowed to go to Peru and collect samples. And it really was addressing the question, where has Globidera come from? And so they used a mitochondrial marker and also microsatellites to, to look at the relationship between these field isolates. And they were able to find where the European populations were most likely to come from. And you can see in the bottom group what's called clade one. In the red boxes, there's some French populations, UK populations, um, Swiss. So they come from, I'm not going to try to use this pointer, am I? No, pointers never work for me. Um, they come from southern Peru. And in addition, the PA1 pathotype, which we know we have in, in Scotland, also comes from that southern region. So it looks, you know, it's very nice. We know at least that we can say things from northern Peru we don't have, we can also try to develop means of, of distinguishing them and keeping them out of Europe because the resistances that we're working with are really focused on these ones from southern Peru. So even putting that in a little bit more context, from our point of view, if you look at the group at the top, we have a Scottish population, we call this one Loch Ness, that falls within that cytochrome B type we have the PA1 group falls into this group in the red. Most of the European populations seem to fall into this yellow group here. But, you know, we can turn to back time and find out exactly what happened, but that's the best we have as a molecular tool to try to figure out where this material has come from. Well, we can add some more um, cytochrome B sequences in from more populations around Europe. And again, you see the vast majority fit into this one particular group. But we have Scottish populations within all three groups. We have diversity in Scotland, so um, that's not necessarily a good thing, but that's, that's what we're, we're trying to deal with. Just wanted to add this. So, you know, in, in the long term, how are we going to manage this? having tools that we can now take our molecular markers and take them into a geographic context are really wonderful. So this was a piece of work that um, a young postdoc, Sebastian Ees van Dacker, did recently, working with our statutory agency, SASA, so where John Pickup is from, to see if we can map where these different types occurred, again using this cytochrome B marker. And what was rather a wonderful opportunity is SASA is now using a DNA-based approach to try to look for where PCN is. They can speciate, so they could give us all the samples that were positive for Globidera pallida. Seb took them, did this cytochrome B um, PCR. He barcoded them. He put them all together, sequenced them, and then he deconvoluted that and then could map where these different types are. So you can see... From the code here, we have type 1, 2, and 3. The middle one, the type 2, was the most interesting thing. So this corresponds to that red group where the PA1s are. And this is the first time we could see that perhaps this PA1 pathotype was more widely distributed than we thought it was. So PA1 was originally collected near Edinburgh. It's now a golf course. You know, we just assumed it's long gone. However, it looks like it could be more widespread. So we're now trying to take cysts from some of these places we're now finding it, 
and phenotype it to see whether we still retain that relationship between the cytochrome B marker and the phenotype, but that takes some time, time to do. What's also interesting about this is we, you know, we were beginning to suspect that if we go to the field, we might have more than one introduction in the same field, so Seb was able to show that there are fields out in Scotland where you have all three types present, so that raises the question, can they hybridize? I mean, if they're all the species in theory, they should be able to hybridize. What is the implication for virulence? Right, so the breeders have taken a long time to get good pallida resistance compared to the Rostock story with H1, but we now have cultivars coming that have very high levels of, Ross, of, of pallida resistance. And they're asking us, you know, should we use them? We've been telling them that maybe pallida is a more complicated problem than Rostock. It may be able to overcome resistance. And they're a little bit nervous about using them, but they're desperate as well to, to find alternatives to nematocytes and something that, you know, will be commercially viable. So Innovator is now out there in the field. Growers are testing it. Arsenal is another one, and Vales Everest is one that um, has come from the breeding program at, at what was the Scottish Crop Research Institute. So the innovator and the arsenal have resistance coming from Solanum vernii, and Vales Everest has resistance from a source I'll call Andegainer. Right, this, when you go look at a pedigree, is what it looks like. And, you know, what do you end up with when you have crosses like this? Oops. So you can see where the bracket is, some of the vernii sources that have been in this pedigree in the past. But 62.33.3, whether the resistance QTL from that source or some of the other sources is what actually gets into Innovator at the end is really difficult to know because these are tetraploids. Um, I'm not sure if every stage and along these have been selected for the resistance. So it's quite complicated to really know what you've got in some of these cultivars at the end of the day. And the same sort of story for Vales Everest. I mean, you could see there's Maris Piper, it has the H1 gene, but we know Vales Everest isn't resistant to Rostock, so it's probably lost H, H1. It has P557, which has an H2 gene to Globidera pallida. We don't know whether it's still in in Vales Everest, but it's way back in the pedigree. Probably the resistance in Vales Everest is coming from 1267 AB1, which has Andagena resistance, but it's very complicated to, to try to know exactly what resistance you're dealing with. The breeders, the geneticists are looking, are developing markers, um, but the markers obviously don't always work, even markers that they have for H1, which are pretty good. Occasionally, there's a recombination between the marker and the gene, so it's not 100% reliable. And when you're using quantitative resistance, it becomes even more complicated to try to keep that resistance and use markers effectively in the breeding program. So the question is, will pallida resistance be durable? So how do we go about trying to test things. So we can test with populations that we have in our collections. And it concerns me that what we have in our collections are populations that were probably brought in from the field 40, 50 years ago, and we've maintained them in the glasshouse for, for a long time, which may have some effect on their you know, biological characteristics. But they're not contemporary populations either. So we are currently trying to, you know, renew our populations that we test with to see if they behave the same, to see if we need to try to add some new things in. We also can test with lines that we have developed for increased resistance to, so we can try to anticipate if you use these resistances over and over again, will you cause some selection? I mean, on the one hand, Maybe that's all going to happen, but on the other hand, if you look at Maris Piper and how popular it has been and how it is used over and over again, selection may be an issue that we need to look at. And we can monitor in the field, and that's why the system that John Pickup is using is very 
nice because you begin to develop historical data that you can then see if new problems are emerging just because it's part of the routine survey that is required as part of the EU directive. So you can, you know, you, without a survey, you really don't have any way of knowing if there's something coming out. So it's, it's a really nice way to, um, to continue to monitor Right, so this is an old slide from a Phillips and Trudgill paper, but it's an example of using a whole bunch of populations to test the vernii resistance and anandagena resistance. And what you can see from this slide is the vernii resistance for European populations doesn't always work so great. In South America, you can see that these populations from the clade three, four, five are not controlled very well with the andagena resistance, so we really don't want these populations to come into the country. And on the extreme of the European populations, this population Loughness appeared to be particularly virulent and a, and a concern if it got, um, became more widespread. So Chavernet is the population that they use within the EU scheme for testing for, for uh, new potato cultivars for, for resistance. We have typically used a population called Linley. It's maybe a little less virulent than Chavernay is, but it gives a similar kind of reaction on these two sources of resistance. And I've picked also Loughness, and although it's not marked on here, the PA1 pathotype with we, which we have in, in Scotland to use as further populations to test. I mean, doing these kind of tests is a huge amount of work. This was done on, in POTS, and I'm sure it was after many tests to try to find a range of populations to use and which genotypes they use. The vernii was actually a mixture of three different clones. I think the andagainer was two different clones. So, you know, doing that routine is, is a lot of work. So we've narrowed down to three examples of populations that we, we've been testing with. For the selection, this is populations that have for 12 years gone through rounds of selection on resistant genotypes. So the yellow ones are coming from Vernii, and the red ones or orange ones are from Andagainer. And this is showing after 12 rounds of multiplication that you can build up the level of virulence on Vernii, but it doesn't if you test those same population on the andagainer, it doesn't transfer over. So, you know, it's su suggesting that selection is specific to that particular source of resistance and vice versa. So if you select on andagainer, you build up some virulence to it, but it isn't transferable to vernia. So that's kind of good. This is one experiment, whether you can assume that's going to be the way forever. Um, but we have this material now with increased virulence that we can work with. Oops. And this is a, a PhD student, Kyriakos Veripatakis from Greece, who's joined us recently. And he's working on, with these selected populations, both to look at why they're more virulent. So he's taking a molecular approach to looking at effectors to see if we can find out which ones are involved in these changes in virulence. But he's also been asked by his funding source to look at some of these new um, cultivars that are coming through to see how they perform. So you can see here a, a graph, Bales Evers Innovator Royal, that he's tested with some of these selected lines. And they're not as good as we might like. The arsenal seems to be pretty good, but Royal with some of these selected lines is not um, behaving particularly well. So although they're 12 years of selection, you know, we have to bear that in mind that selection could be an issue. Um, we do pot tests at the Institute, but for these assays, we use a root trainer system so we can open the, um, we can see the roots and if you want to collect the females, you can just open them up, pick them off the surface of the root. But we also use it as a scoring system if we want to look at relative reproduction rates. Um, it's just a lot quicker than doing pot tests. So, up until recently, those are the two options. Innovator has the Vernii source of resistance, um, things like Bales Everest have the Andagainer source, but the breeders have been putting those resistances together. Um, and this is a paper from a couple years ago from Dan Milburn's group in, in Ireland, 
where they've been able to use markers for the two main QTLs in Vernier and Andegainer and make, uh, pick out individuals that had either, either of those QTLs or combinations of them and test them to see if there's a benefit of combining those two QTLs. And as you can see from this graph, this was done with the Chavernet population. There is a small benefit from having those QTLs together. We don't know how that might affect selection, but you'd kind of hope that if you put two QTLs together that it might slow down any selection pressure. So they've now got markers that can be used to try to bring these resistances together. Now, the breeders tell me that the Vernii resistance that's in this GPA5 is now a different Vernii resistance. And I'm told it comes from an excess in LGU8. I have no idea what that is. Um, but that adds to the complication. So now the breeders are no longer using the Vernii source from 62333, which wasn't that great. And they've switched over to this uh, Vernii source, which is an innovator. Um, just part of the way that things happen. Another student, Brian Rigney, he's also, f uh, he just finished his PhD from Dan Milburn's um, lab. He wanted to um, test with more populations this idea of whether combining QTLs would be useful. So this is some of his data. He's used the Lindley population now, which is kind of our equivalent to the Chavernet. Loughness, which has that higher virulence on the, on the Vernii. Farset and Newton, which were two other populations which show very lowish levels of virulence or higher. And he again shows the same effect that adding QTLs together can be beneficial. And he used this root trainer method for, for doing that. Okay, so pyramiding the resistance now is what we're trying to do. Innovator and Bales Everest or parents or grandparents are what are the breeders are using to uh, to put these together. This is a, a colleague of mine, Xinwei Chen, from our potato genetics program. He's been helping me again with these root trainer trials that um, we've done last year and this year. And we've, okay, I'll just explain that. Uh, you know, pot tests are possible, but they're huge amount of work to wash out the cysts and then enumerate the cysts. So we use a root trainer system. We can screen a thousand plants in a couple of days with a couple of people. So it's, it's a much quicker system to use. Okay, I also wanted to add this in. This is the um, scoring scheme that is used in Europe to rank cultivars in terms of their levels of resistance. And if you can want more information, talk to John Pickup about it. We're looking for scores of nine. So if, if you look at H1 in the Maris Piper, it would score a nine. Up until recently, we didn't have any Palada resistance that would score as high as that. But now things like Innovator, Arsenal are giving really high scores. So that's the standard we want to, to aim at. Okay, so my colleagues in the breeding program said, okay, right, you know, you want to test this material. Um, they gave us 250 clones from various breeding programs, McCain, Branston, um, Greenvale, the, the breeding program within the Institute, and we've tested them. You can see the susceptible Desiree up on the right-hand side and Innovator and Bales Everest down at the low levels of multiplication. So this is just female scores on the root ball, um, trying to see if we've got good material to take forward in the breeding program. I was concerned that we were only testing with one population in our system, whether the Luffness and our PA1 pathotype might behave differently. Should we be testing with them? Is a root trainer system oh, uh, giving us similar data to the canister system that they're using in the breeding program. So it's, we're asking a number of questions with this. It's still kind of rough data, but I just wanted to show where we're at with it. Um, it was interesting that the spikes that we see, you know, sometimes a genotype will have higher multiplication on it with the Luffness and the PA1 population than with the Lindley. So these are all ranked on, on Lindley. So we need to go back and look to see whether that's reproducible between the two years of data. You know, this 2016 data was just from about two weeks ago. 
um, to see whether we need to worry that you're losing maybe something in the background that those two populations may be able to um, multiply more on. Do we need to test with more than one population or not? That's the question we're trying to, trying to get at here. So just taking um, the left-hand graph from 2016 and expanding it a bit, you know, the really good news is if you look at Innovator, all three populations have very low multiplication on them. And there's a lot of other lines in there that are similar. So, you know, we've got material coming through the breeding programs now that look like they're really good. But we possibly have things that we should be weeding out as well, you know, where we have these spikes. If those spikes are real and reproducible, we need to also be testing with more populations to make sure that we don't, you know, feed things out to the industry, which really isn't broad spectrum. Um, okay, yeah, so just f a few final things. Um, recently, we started working on the H2 resistance. This has been known about since the 60s. It comes from Solanum multidisectum, but it didn't seem to go anywhere because it was really um, considered to be only useful for the PA1 pathotype. If you look at P55-7 on this graph, it's not just PA1 that gives some resistance. Um, it also has some partial resistance to other pathotypes. So we're interested in it because it might be another good gene to pyramid with. It seems to be a single major gene, so it's genetically less complicated. And we now have, oops, Shona Strachan. She's going to talk about this project more this afternoon. She's working on mapping this resistance gene and hopefully um, developing markers, which we can then test. So we're already crossing this resistance into the material that has both Andagain and Vernii resistance, so we can see if we can combine three resistances, and we should be able to look at that in the next couple of years. So if you want to attend Shona's talk later on, um, she'll be mentioning or going over how she's going about mapping this resistance. It seems to be on uh, chromosome 5, where a lot of the resistances to Globodera pallida are. And Ulrika Gartner, she's just started her PhD funded by the Global Project. One of the things she'll be working on is Solanum spegazzini. And this seems to have a large effect, QTL, on chromosome 5. It's, again, material that isn't being um, developed, but we have material at the, at the Institute, and we're going to try to map it and see whether we can have it as a, another resistance. So, you know, we're trying to kind of make sure that in the future we've got alternatives, if we ever can do GM and we can isolate some of res these resistances, they'd be an alternative um, for the future. Maybe also as a tool to pull out virulence genes to see if we can see how they're working. So just to um, not make my world seem like the only world, uh, John Pickup brought this to our attention two days ago. This is um, a russet type potato which has been bred by Agrico, which is one of the Dutch breeding programs. It appears to have very good resistance to Globodera pallida. So, you know, there's a lot of other breeding work going on. In, um, in Cornell, they breed to RO2. You know, there's many companies and, and uh, other academic institutions around the world that are, that are working on resistance to pallida. So I'm, I'm really encouraged that, you know, we're, we're going to get good stuff and um, maybe fix this problem. So just want to mention some of my colleagues, Ingo Glenn and Zhenwei from the um, Potato Genetics Group, and Drummond, Vanessa, and Ralph from the Commercial Breeding Program at the Institute, the students Shona, Akis, Brian, and Ulrika, who are now working on, on Resistance 7, John, who've helped a lot on the molecular side, and Alex Reed and John Pickup at um, SASA. Thank you.